fondly called the doctor in the kitchen, Chef Elijah Amoado is a Ghanaian chef and social entrepreneur using his experience within the culinary industry to create efficient and sustainable means of nutrition for low-income families and vulnerable communities across sub-Saharan Africa. Chef Elijah Amoado, at 29 years, is the founder and CEO of Food for All Africa, a food recovery company that operates was Africa's first community food service through food recovery, redistribution, farming and forum for stakeholders within the food supply chain. Food for All Africa leverage on technology to bring food to its target communities, mostly low-income and vulnerable. His organization recovers between $8,000 to $10,000 worth of food monthly to support over 5,885 Five beneficiaries across Ghana. Food for All Africa was in 2014 selected as one of the 100 global best practices and end hunger and poverty in Ghana by Dubai International Awards for best practices. Chef Elijah was in June 2017 awarded by Queen Elizabeth II as the 2017 Queen's Young Leader at Beckingham Palace for his courage and passion for reinventing Africans' food system by bridging the food gap between plenty and scarce within communities. He has trained over 2,000 youth to become cooks and chefs across West Africa through his Chefs on Wheel project. Our vision is eradicating food waste and hunger across African continent is gradually being achieved. A few links about my work and organization are as follows. www.foodforallafrica.org And that is a special human being we are celebrating this morning right here on TLS. We are live on GH1 TV. My name is Angela Bamford. Good morning and welcome. We are also streaming live on Facebook. So make sure to direct your comments and thoughts to our Facebook page, GH1 TV. Yes, I have Chef Elijah Omoadu. What a special person, a man with a heart of gold. And I am so excited to be here with him in the studio about to converse, you know, have a conversation about his work, his philanthropy, and how he's used his skills as uh, as a chef to give back to society. Welcome once again. My name is Angela Bamford. All right, so let's meet Chef Adu. Chef, welcome. Thank you, Angela. How are you doing? I'm good. Very well. Now, Chef, how does it feel seeing things like that or seeing a video like that about yourself? Uh, it, it's quite emotional, it's most often than not. It cast my mind back to when I was just a 10-year-old boy losing my mom. I was the only boy among a family of four. And then my childhood dream as the only boy was to become a medical doctor. So when I look back at some of these videos, it just brings back to mind that yes indeed uh at least i'm living my life towards so, so, uh, supporting society mm. in one way or the other so you, you just mentioned at 10 years old losing your parents at that young age tell us about young elijah at that time what was the experience like well uh i grew up uh basically in the care of my my grandmom uh, life was okay as the only boy among a family of four girls uh, you m imagine i was the that the, the high of the family mm -hmm. yeah so i got all the privileges as the only boy not until one day i go went to school and came back and just by the twinkle of an eye my mom was no more few months later my dad also wasn't anymore and i was left in the care of my grandma initially and she was someone who s could feel the pains because my mom was also so close to her mm -hmm. and i couldn't stand it it was quite emotional so at a point my auntie who stays in lagos nigeria had to come in come and take me and one of my sisters to Nigeria so that we go and school there. 
so that I can get it. It affected me psychologically because I couldn't imagine life without my mother, especially. At 10 because years I, old. Yes, and I was mm. so close to her. Uh, she was my everything. So for me, it was the movement from Ghana to Nigeria that kind of gave me the opportunity to start also thinking about life from the perspective of uh, a young boy whose life has been changed through the codance of death. Mm -hmm. And it gave me that opportunity to see life from a different perspective mm -hmm. in the sense that culturally I'm in a different setting. I get to see how people behave in Nigeria, which is quite different from Ghana. And as well, it also opened my eyes to helping people mm -hmm. at a very tender age. So at 10, 12, uh, uh, at the age of 10 or 12, you moved to Nigeria. You mentioned the cultural difference. But as, as a young boy at that time, how did you cope? How did you cope with that change and with that move? My auntie tried as much as possible to occupy the place of my mother. And I remember back then, the first day she took me to school, actually, she introduced me to the head teacher of the school that this is my son and right then then i just burst out and say oh she's not my mommy she's my auntie she felt so sad about that incident but for me i wasn't able to have come i've not overcome that pain up till today that when i look at some of the work i do mm -hmm. that part of me that incident is actually part of my my being yes and absolutely. it's part of what has shaped my principles and my philosophy in life waking up every morning knowing that my life on earth can come to an end in the twinkle of a second mm -hmm. so for me what counts more what matters for me more about this life is what i'll be remembered for what do I remember my mother for? I remember my mother for the work I do. So I ended up a chef because I was the only boy. Whenever my mother would cook, I'm the one to taste the food in the house. Hey, you had the post. If, yes. And if I don't <laughs> taste it, no one gets that chance. So anytime I'm cooking, it, it, I do get that feeling that she's around me. She's happy with what i'm doing mm. and that was how my path moved from being a, 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 a medical doctor to being a chef i actually went to aquinas and so after school when a lot of my colleagues later got to know that uh, their classmate is now a chef they started calling me the doctor in the kitchen, and that's what... <laughs> <laughs> the doctor in the kitchen, I like that. Now, so you've moved to Nigeria. You're trying to get acclimated to the new change, you know, the cultural shock, what, what have you. How did moving to Nigeria, coming back to Ghana, and going back to Nigeria, that's what I read, yeah. you know, find your, you, you found your way to, to cooking. I know that you worked for a chef in Lagos. Tell us about that. Yes, so... After JHS, I came back to Ghana, had my SHS, and then after SHS, I was an orphan left in the care of my uh, external family. And most of them actually wanted the best for me, but they, what they wanted for me at that point, in that critical stage of my life, was that most were like, I should go to teacher's training college to become a teacher. I would get allowance and all that. Mm -hmm. and after SS, I got very good results, but dearly, what I wanted to do with my life, it was as if all the people that seemed to care about me didn't understand me. So I had to go back to Nigeria. So at SS level, yes. you had already decided to be a chef. Is that what you're saying? No. At okay. SS level, I'd actually made my mind. To be Do medicine. Yes. And so I read general science in St. Thomas Aquinas. Mm. So after school, 
Then my relatives were like, well, that's not a field we think you can go because the financial support. Right. However, some were proposing I go to uh, GIG. So I actually got admission to GIG, uh, went one day, sat in the class, and I was like, no, that's not where I belong. So I had to go back to Nigeria to my auntie. So when I went back to Nigeria, I got a job as a kitchen cleaner. And in this, as a kitchen cleaner, I always will wash the pans when the The chefs cook Mm. and all that. Then one day, as I was in a hurry to go home, the chef had prepared the sauce. And it was by the sink where I usually wash my bowls before i close and so i thought it was basically something that i didn't need so i threw the sauce away and then washed it he came back to the kitchen few minutes later was so furious that where is his sauce he's gonna use it is someone was waiting for it to be used for an order and i said oh i didn't know so out of the hunger i started throwing pans that mm-hmm. have washed plates and so as he was throwing it, then I just burst out with cry. I started crying, and I'm, I was like, I don't know where the words came from. Do you think I'll be here washing pants if, whilst my colleagues are in school? So when I made that statement, as I was crying, he also got emotional. Apparently, this chef is from, is a Lebanese. Uh, mm-hmm. Had also had a similar story of losing his parents at a tender mm. age. So he became so close to me. He wanted to know more about why I am in that kitchen as a kitchen cleaner. So later he became a mentor. He opened up his kitchen to me to a point where now when he <coughs> says he wants to do this, all he has to do is say, Elijah. Today, I'm preparing this, and the next moment, I will make sure all the ingredients he needs are on the table, working table, ready for him to prepare what he wanted to. And so that gave me the opportunity to learn, explore more about what goes on in a commercial kitchen. Mm. So at the point, we had the discussion of what am I doing with my life, because he felt I was good. He felt I had a story that I was someone he could help. And I told him, well, this is who, what I want to do. I want to, I think whenever I'm in the kitchen, I became happy. Mm-hmm. And it also brought that moment that I've spent with my mom in the kitchen. So he easily, I easily connected to food. And then he supported me to have my vocational course. And then gave me a permanent job in his kitchen as a chef as de a party. Chef. Now, you, you said something. Do you think I'll be a kitchen cleaner if my parents were alive? And that's what you know, pushed this chef to, to mentor you. Cast your mind back to, to that time, point in time. How, how did you cope emotionally and psychologically? Because as a young boy, losing your parents, moving to a new country, living with external family, having to work while your, your, your friends were in school. How did you keep going? What kept me going was the idea, the, the story of my grandmother is in Ghana taking care of my younger sisters to school. And I critically remember as a young boy, my mom had some sayings, some kind of uh, 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 short stains mm-hmm. with me. Mm-hmm. She, I always remember my mom saying, Oputu Oye, meaning if you don't work, you will not eat. Mm-hmm. I remember my mom always telling me that uh, there will be, I, when I was born, actually, the mm-hmm. name given to me was Edward. That was the name that my dad gave to me. But as a result of divinity, I think my mom actually changed my name to Elijah. And so back in school, it became a contemplation. But what she, I remember her always saying that Elijah means Jehovah is my God. Mm -hmm. And I felt this, when I was going through those times, 
th th those were the things that keep encouraging me, that keep casting my mind back to, oh, okay, so she basically helped, told me these things. She prepared to, you for that yes. in some way. way. Yeah. And so that was the things that actually kept me going. And that actually also shaped the kind of person that I have become today. Mm. And I always tell people that uh, some parents leave their children well. They leave them a lot of opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I feel what my mother left me is more than worth. And it is what has made me the person that I am today. Wow. Wow. Now, Elijah, from, from cooking and cleaning in the restaurant at Lagos to a food bank, how did that come about? Yeah, so at a point, a Lebanese businessman visited the restaurant where we were, I worked in Lagos. Mm. And he was so much enthused to know that there's a Ghanaian chef working in that restaurant. So he, got, he became a friend of mine. Then one day he told me that he's opening a new restaurant in Laboni. And I said, oh, well, I know Laboni very well. I said, I should come down. So he supported me to come down to Ghana. So I was with him for about two years. And then I got a job with a hotel around Northridge. And in this hotel, I what we did was, it was a huge hotel. So usually when we cook after the buffet whatsoever, we threw the leftover foods into the dustbin. And there is this mentally challenged man. He sits under the Nima overhead. What this man does is every morning, he will pick bags, rubber bags from the floor, go to Osu, go to restaurants, hotels that are within Osu reach their trash bin. Mm. They will pick leftover foods from the trash bin tie them in small bags. Wow. He goes to street sellers who sell wachi. Usually when people come and eat this food, the leftovers, they always put it in rubber. He will pick and then share to his colleagues under the Nima Bridge on the streets. So I, I saw him doing the sharing. And one time too, I saw him also picking the leftovers from the hotel where I worked. So one day I said, let me find out from this guy why he does that. Yes. So I went to work early, met him collecting from our trash bin, and I was like, ah, boss, I didn't know you were a boss, you were a boss, and you were a boss, you were a boss. And this mentally challenged man was like, semanya, why never? And that statement immediately didn't mean anything to me, but it later struck me to ask myself, well, this is a mentally challenged man. I asked him a question, and he threw back a question of, mm -hmm. if he doesn't do, who is going to do it? So that kind of started creating a passion in me where I felt more happy connecting whatever surplus food we get from the restaurant mm. to <clears throat> people on the streets. So I started somewhere, this happened somewhere 2011. So I started what was known as Chefs for Change Ghana Foundation. I spoke with different chefs from different hotels and restaurants, not to throw their surplus buffet or surplus food that is left. They should just call me or connect a closer beneficiary. So at that point, the hotel where I was working with, actually every day will call Accra Psychiatric Hospital to say that, well, we have after buffet tonight, we have this early tomorrow morning. You guys can pick it up. Sometimes they will take it to them. Mm -hmm. And so it became, and I realized it created an interest in me to know more about how the food supply chain in Ghana worked. Then I realized we are a country of, uh, let's say, about 25 million by then. Mm. And we always talk about the fact that food, knowing, staying in Nigeria and Ghana, I knew when you come to Ghana, it's one of the countries where, in West Africa, where food is quite expensive to come by. True. And so 
I started asking myself, if food is expensive, why is food going to, to waste? waste? Then I learned more and more. And my passion, my knowledge, <laughs> taste for knowledge within food supply chain grew so much to the point that I realized food waste is not just we the hotels, the restaurants, but as well, even from the farms, even the, the, the food supply chain, there are inefficiencies within it. And I was even surprised at a point to realize somewhere in 1990, uh, AMA with support from FAO Ghana had a conference mm. to talk about how our market system should be, uh, should be made in, by 2020 in order to meet the growing demand for food, the growing population, and all that. Mm. So that was what gave me that opportunity to say, well, there need to be an alternative food distribution system that can bring food to those who don't have purchasing power. Yeah. And through that, 2015, we formed Food, food for, for Africa. All Africa. Wow. All right, so Chef Elijah has mentioned Food for All Africa. When we come back from this break, we'll get into how uh, his culinary skills took him all the way to England to meet the Queen herself. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. I'm just not ready yet. I want to wait a little before getting pregnant again. Stop worrying and live free. No matter who you are, Lydia has a contraceptive just for you. Choose the Lydia Daily Contraceptive Pill with iron as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD, a non-hormonal contraceptive for long-term pregnancy prevention. Contact the Lydia Contact Center and let us help you decide how to live free. With Lydia, you truly decide. Live sports are very good. Go TV Subium, Fiti La Liga, Syria, Premier League, WWE, Kwasi Ningina, Yagi Abedja, and Subini Babiara. What about you? Go TV, never can live sports and EJ. What super sponsor and what Go TV Max or so? Connecting and now reconnecting to Go TV and what pay what the point to be and as a mobile agent to her. Now, big things they happen. Go TV antenna, decoder, any one man subscription, and your 109 Ghana cities to pay. Go TV. Believe it. Love it. You've dreamt of this moment for so long, and it's time for you to take a walk into the spotlight. It's another tinsel season of Miss Malaika, and we're giving you the opportunity to be our next crown queen. In line with the new normal, our first audition will be a virtual one. We want to get to know you ladies, so send a one-minute profile video of yourself to the WhatsApp number you see on your screen. Telling us your name, what drives you, your age, your occupation, and most importantly, why you want to be a part of this life-changing experience. A number of shortlisted ladies from these entries will meet our judges. The submission for the profile videos for Miss Malaika 2020 is on from now to the 20th of July. The search is on for our new queen. I'm just not ready yet. I want to wait a little before getting pregnant again. Stop worrying and live free. No matter who you are, Lydia has a contraceptive just for you. Choose the Lydia Daily Contraceptive Pill with iron as your regular contraceptive or the Lydia IUD, a non-hormonal contraceptive for long-term pregnancy prevention. Contact the Lydia Contact Center and let us help you decide how to live free. With Lydia, 
you truly decide. Welcome back. You're still watching TLS on GH1 TV. We are streaming live on Facebook as well. So if you have a comment or a thought to share, do make sure to send them to our Facebook page, GH1 TV. I'm still here with Chef Elijah. And we've been talking about his childhood, um, um, his, his journey to Nigeria, and of course, his journey to food, and now how he's using his skills as a chef to give back to society. Now, chef, you mentioned food for all Africa, uh, born out of the need to feed the vulnerable using the surplus that you get from your restaurant. Now, how did you scale it up to the to the points that it, it is at this moment? How did that transition happen? Yes. Yeah, so when we started, uh, demand for feeding the vulnerable was so high and there wasn't we looked within the laws of ghana to see if there are provisions that actually made uh, food available to vulnerable people mm. there wasn't enough we could talk about the only one we came about was uh, pndc law fda in 1996 and it just talked about food by the safety of food by donation. donation. So we thought if we can create an alternative platform or alternative distribution channel, that will be socially focused towards bringing food, be it free or affordable to vulnerable communities. And initially it was challenging, but over the years we built reputation with stakeholders and as we went along we thought about innovative ways we can bring this food to people then we realized the thing about people or individuals and organizations wanting to give food out to the vulnerable but the platform for them to use mostly is not there mm. sometimes companies want to donate food to uh, 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 orphanages to vulnerable communities and they have to take on the job of sourcing for the food they have to take on the job of making sure that the food gets to so we realize there is an opportunity there so we wrote to companies if you want to do charity be it cooked food be it ingredients that you want to donate to any organization wherever in this country leave the rest that job for us let us know who and where you want to do this donation mm. tell us what you have in mind and we will make sure that the day comes you come and do the donation oh. we make the work easier for most corporate bodies to run their food donations mm. and as well what we also did was we also gave opportunity to companies that want their staff to learn the heart of volunteering so we initiated a program we call share your breakfast on saturdays companies can sign up their staff for a, a month every saturday of that month we take them to some beneficiary communities we cook they pay to actually volunteer wow. we cook and then at the end we provide them with certificate with skills of knowing how it is for people to be on the streets or being vulnerable because being vulnerable can happen at any time it happened to me let's talk about that you know you've spoken about the companies the other side that how do the people accept you because i know sometimes they may need it but they may not exactly trust you they don't know where the food is coming from yeah. it may be poisonous what was that uh, you know Acceptance yes. like yes. So, given the fact that um, I have quite a knowledge in uh, culinary skills, that helped a lot. It made me to be able to be accepted. And the other thing I also did was I built an advisory board made up of multi stakeholders. So, one of my advisory board uh, members is actually a, 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 a manager at the Food and Drugs Authority. I have on my advisory board, I have people with experience 
over 30, 40 years within Ghana's food supply chain. Mm. And I worked closely with the Food and Beverage Association of Ghana. As well. So this network and then advisory board is what has helped to push and for people to accept the work we do at Food for All Africa. Mm. Now, how did you distribute w what you got? I mean, there are some people at Nima and here and here. How did you create a distribution, uh, distribution chain for the, the vulnerable? So initially, we, we have programs that go straight to beneficiaries on the streets. Mm -hmm. And that is our hot meal system. So on weekends, tomorrow being Sunday, for instance, we go directly to the street. On weekends, mostly people, there's no much of business going on. So we are able to identify them easily. And then as well, we work with community organizations. Okay. So we know aged groups in Nima. If we want to uh, reach out to the aged people in Nima, we go through uh, LPH mm. Nima. If we want to reach out to disabled people, we know the community, we know the kind of organization. So through those organizations, we are able to reach out to our beneficiaries. Mm. Tell us about some of, some of these beneficiaries. So we've we've had benef we have been beneficiaries like schools. Okay. Uh, in, in Teshi, we have in different areas. We as well have if, United Way. So some of our beneficiaries or uh, organizations actually also work in different areas. They work in education. Some work in health. So we bring in the food to complement. So for instance, United Way Ghana being an educational focus NGO mm. during the, this COVID season. We launched a Food for All Ghana Community Emergency Intervention Program. Before even government started their distribution, uh -huh. we launched one. And then so United Way Ghana, being an educational focus NGO, came to partner has to say that, okay, we've also done farm raising. Mm -hmm. We want to extend food support to our people who are now in their houses mm -hmm. and then their parents. So we work on the food aspect of reaching okay. out to. We work with Social Enterprise Ghana. Social Enterprise Ghana is actually made up of social companies in Ghana that have uh, profit making by the same impact at the basis mm. of what they do. So for instance, Social Enterprise Ghana wants to also reach out to uh, people whose businesses have been affected. And so they come to us through the, our working relationship to say that, okay, can you make food boxes at this then, cost so that we add some basic reliefs in addition to the food boxes and then, and then we do the distribution. We also have the logistics to do the, the, the distribution. Now, now, Chef, I get it. You are, you are a chef, um, you're a cook, but why is it important to feed the vulnerable? It is very important. One, for me, from a to personal, you mm -hmm. a personal experience point of view, uh, losing my parents taught me that vulnerability is actually not limited to people who are born poor. Von anyone can be vulnerable at, at any, any given time. What are the systems that we have put in place? And so that one what is one of the reasons why I think feeding people is important. Secondly, also, food is a basic need. Because the ingredients we use in preparing food, I always say that even though you buy those ingredients, it's the head that gave it to you. Mm. All you needed to do was to plant a seed. And God gave, this, out of the small seed, life. you got abundance of food ingredients. And so if you're a farmer, if you work around food, people would always say that, why is it that nowadays everybody is working within the food sector? Because it is profitable. And so the same way it is profitable, 
They say rights and responsibilities. Mm. So if you f- work with food as a business, it is a responsibility to ensure that those who don't have the purchasing power can at least also f- have a feel of what you are using to make that money. Mm. And so that, for me, is one reason. And if you look at countries that we term developed, you look at how their social systems work, you realize that they have encouraged the idea of food banking. Currently, Food for All Africa, we are working with Global Food Banking Mm -hmm. Network, which is a a U.S.-based organization. And this is a multi-million dollar non-profit organization that each year raises more than $500 million wow. to support food banks, food community organizations across the U.S., across the world, so that people can have access to food. And that tells you that that food is one thing that most at times can let people lose their dignity. Because out mm, of hunger... Let's talk about that. Out of hunger... Someone can enter into a shop to steal food. Out of anger, someone can tend to do things that it's not supposed to do. Sometimes in the evening, I drive on the streets of Accra. Mm -hmm. I meet people from prostitutes, from destitute people. And I try to talk to some of these people. And you get to know that. Is just whatever risk they are putting their life through is just to basic. ensure that they have a basic need, which is food. Food comes before even they think about shelter. And that tells you the importance of food mm. to human survival. We buy fuel into our cars. We buy fuel into our cars. We eat. Even doc- medical doctors will not be able to do their work without food. Food. And the work, I I tell my colleagues who have become medical doctors, whenever they recommend a patient to me to say that, look, this medicine is what we're giving you, but we want you to change your diet. We want Mm. Chef Elijah to go to this man. He will work with you on nutrition nutrition and and, mm -hmm. and all. I tell people that if we don't, eat the right food if we, people don't get nutrition that is when doctors get patients yes do. yes so, yes uh, so i mean in ghana there's something we say come here yeah yeah you know and like you said you rightly said when someone is uh, hungry they will do all sorts of things that under normal circumstances they wouldn't do just to feed themselves and you know someone a, a wise person once said if you have three meals give one away and eat two because at least one meal can save someone's life. Now, let's talk about how your culinary arts, you know, found you at Buckingham Palace. How, how did that happen? Yeah, so mostly people have thought it's my culinary arts. Okay. That my skills in cooking that yes. took me to Buckingham Palace. But I've always said that it's actually food for all. That my, that singular initiative of bringing food to the vulnerable. Oh. So from 2013, every World Food Day, we try to raise awareness on hunger. We try to raise awareness on food waste in Ghana. And in 2015, I was able to gather a group of young Ghanaians who believed in the right to food. Mm. So we said we are attempting a Guinness World Record for the longest food table on the Oxford Street. <laughs> we, we built the table. We couldn't break the record. But that day, I stood back and felt so emotional. To and the you point, led this? Yes. And we had, what we did was wow. we had beneficiaries, vulnerable people from orphanages and different areas coming to sit on one side of the table. And we have people who can afford food, food sitting on the other. So what happens is if you buy a food, be it 10 CD, you are giving two packs. Mm. You sit on one side, you give one to the other the vulnerable side. person on the side. As you eat together, you interact. And you so, realize that there's really not much that differentiates us. Yes. 
it's just opportunity and access to those opportunities that you know may separate someone from the 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 you know upper class or yeah. middle class from lower class yeah i i that's amazing yeah that's amazing and, and i i during that program there were a lot of people from the expatriate community so there was this one that came to me and was like is quite impressed with what we have done he got to know more about so we kept contact until tw late 2016 he sent a message to me that the queen of england is going to celebrate 60 years on the throne and they have initiated a project to recognize people across the commonwealth young people across the commonwealth who are using their skills for the betterment of society and that's you on our screens there yeah such a proud and, moment and so i got the chance to be selected as one of those people i when i was told we i'm going to be the queen i thought it was a lie, a lie. So i got to uk and was expecting to be taken straight to Beckham palace but <laughs> we were rather taken to cambridge uh -huh. where we stayed for about two days we were taught by a lot of professors on how we can make whatever we're doing in our community sustainable then the day came for us to collect our award from the queen and that day i took uh, my ghanaian traditional dress of course, that's I, also, from Ghana. I also took my chef jacket along. But after I've wore the traditional dress, that something said to me that, look, you got this far because of what you do and not just because of where you are coming from. from. So immediately I wore my chef jacket. And I was the third person to receive the award out of 60 young people. When I got to receive my award, the queen just got struck by the father, I'm a chef. Mm -hmm. And it was like, where are you from? I said, I'm from Ghana. Then he, has, he spoke to me. So actually, it was an award ceremony, but for more than two, three minutes, she was speaking, she was to you. speaking with me. Then I went. We had, after the awards, we had a picture session. I was behind. And then, after the pictures, I just heard, where is the chef? Where is the chef? Everybody was calling, where is the chef? Apparently, the queen still wanted to speak with you. know more about what I do. Yes. Then I said, oh, this and that, and that is what I do. Then, the, I, the, she asked me if I should cook for her, what would I? Then I said, I'll do <laughs> watches. So then the media back then took it so much and spoke. And for me, yes, it's, it brought to bear the fact that I'm a Ghanaian chef. However, I felt the message of bringing food to the vulnerable should be more key. And it is one thing that has also helped to scale the work we do at Food for All Africa. Mm. I'm so blessed with a team of like-minded young people who believe that any time they come to work, it's worth the sacrifice to ensure that people have access to food. Now, Chef, this may seem you know trivial, but I want to ask this. Have you ever gone hungry? Growing up, yes. But since I started Food for All Africa, I do get go broke sometimes, but never have... Given back to society, go never, broke. Never have I gone hungry. Because always, there are, always, when I go so broke, there are people who knowing what I've done for them. There are people that have actually served food to on the streets, that are back on their feet, that sometimes call me, I've sent you this money, used for something. Wow. There are people. I, there was this program, we were doing an outreach on a Sunday. We, this young man, he sleeps at the Independence Square. I gave him food and I didn't know him from anywhere. Another time, years later, about two, three years later, we were on the streets. He approached me and told me, Chef, 
do you remember me? I said, no, I don't. Then he told me, uh, when I first, after school, when I first came to Accra, I was sleeping at Independence Square. You were actually, mm -hmm. you oh. gave me food. And today I'm working. And he has always been so close. He's been very supportive of the work we do. And some of these stories Chef, actually, why are you tearing up? Some of these stories actually gives me hope to wake up every morning and say that we, we can bring food. And this is why we, on this show, it's important for us to tell stories like this. Because as, as a human race, we, we won't go anywhere without un being united and without assisting each other. Wow. So someone you helped. I'm so grateful to the individuals, the corporate bodies. When I started this, I never expected that anyone would really understand what we do at Food for All Africa. But there are individuals, owner of Quatsins, Mazmat, Mr. Fadi Wale, since 2015, took me up and said, I believe in you. This man has, uses his resources, uses everything he mm. has. My board, I have, I never imagined such people. Mm -hmm. Chef Elijah, you've, you've made it to Buckingham Palace. You've achieved so much at such a young age. If your mother were alive today, what would you say to her? And what do you think she'd say back to you? I've always said that, and I do always get that feeling that she's always proud and happy that I do what I do. She mm. is. Mm. Whenever I'm into the work that I do, I hear voices, some of the things she said to me when I was young. I do hear the reflections. It's mm. as if she speaks to me. She still appears in my dreams. Mm -hmm. And she's always happy with what I do. 19 years later. Yeah. Wow. So what's, what's in store for you? What does the future look like? I've always said that. For me, each day... I wake up, I take it as an opportunity to reach out to someone out there. All that I want in this life is to feed people. And on the day that I'm called to the afterlife, on my grave, I don't even want my name to be written. <laughs> All that I want to be written is Okunkom. Okunkom, Ampa. The hunger fighter. Ampa, Ampa, Ampa. Now, <sighs> What, what you mentioned that you you sometimes go broke even for for what you do aside your mother and aside the fact that you feed people and you ukum ekom what keeps you going how do you motivate yourself what keeps you waking up in the morning to do what you do so on the when I started this. Uh, I needed an helper at a point I felt I needed an helper. And yeah. so at age 22, I was fortunate to meet this lady who pretty well understands the work I do. Uh -huh. And immediately I thought this is the right person. Well, Amina Ayoko and she became my wife. Uh -huh. And wow. God being so good, we have four children, two boys, two girls. And any time I wake up every morning, what I say to myself is, I want my children to catch me in the act of feeding vulnerable people mm. so that when I'm mm -hmm. gone, I definitely know they get somewhere and mention their name and say, I am the son, son. I am the daughter of Chef Elijah then they will know that 
the little act of feeding people that their father did actually can open doors for them. For them. And it's what keeps me going. Very well. Now, Chef, we have something for you. Um, just something, a token to say thank you and are you cool for what you do, giving back to society the way you do, giving yourself out the way you do. We, we thank you so much. And uh, we, we, we believe that God will take you further, even further than what he's already done. So if um, you would bring the items, these are from NASCO. Thank you so much. Blender and a steamer, a three-layer pan, um, just to say thank you. And thank are you, you cool? I really appreciate it. Very well. Now, if you had one advice to give to the young people like yourself watching us this morning, what would you say to them? I always say that. I would say, what I would say is, I know that the country in which we live is hard. Opportunities for young people is very hard to come by. But within these challenges that we face as a country lies opportunities. And sometimes look at your passion. Identify how you can use your passion to actually solve some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Just start doing it. Definitely there will be someone out there watching who will one day say that I want to step in to help you. Mm, very well. Now, where can people find you? On social media, if they want to reach out to you, to assist you, how can they do that? So, we are on social media, both Chef Elijah Ado, mm -hmm. at Chef Elijah Ado, Instagram, Facebook, and as well, we are on Facebook. And if you even Google, our organization yeah. yeah and we are located on the sprinters road we are directly opposite casa preco casa preco you see our sandboard being mm. there football africa and congratulations on the app as well i know you Thank came you. up with a new yeah. app very well i hope you enjoyed the show this morning um chef elijah made me very emotional um you know i come here yeah uh, come here and if you've been hungry before you know what i mean thank you so much for joining us this morning you can uh, make your way to facebook um, to catch up if you miss any parts i'll see you um next week same time here on j20 my name is angela balfour thank you so much for your time all right chef stand with me